Saturday, October 22nd marked the start of Amy West 2022, a yearly event held in Sacramento, California, celebrating Commodore's Amiga personal computer. We've been doing this for 25 times. I don't want to say 25 years, the 24th year, I don't understand the math. 25 Amy Wests, it's insane. In the five years that I've been doing the show, this is um, probably the biggest or at least one of the biggest shows we've had. Um, a lot of exhibitors coming, a lot of last minute people coming saying, please let me, let me show my stuff. We do have the exhibition floor and that's open to really anyone who wants to do any, any demonstrations or any sales. They can bring their gear. We actually have a Atari Falcon sitting here next to me. Just a whole variety of, of what people want to share, you know, what their love and interest is. I got three tables today for Amy West, starting with my Amiga 2000 that I have here that I've got my video toaster set up on. Then I brought my beautiful Amiga 1000 that I have purchased here back in uh, 2019. My latest edition was the CDTV and people have been enjoying playing uh, Xenon on that. My Amiga 1200 is full of Amiga Art Contest 2022 images right now. Images, videos, um, mod files that will just knock your socks off. My Amiga 600 is using the new A630 accelerator card and I've got some games on that. And then <laughs> I've taken this little seven inch screen, an LCD screen, and I've got it connected to the A500 Mini. So the whole thing is like this little tiny baby Amiga, but it works perfectly, plays games, runs Amiga OS. Uh, it's just adorable. One standout exhibit was the Re Amiga 4091 project, a recreation of Commodore's high-speed SCSI controller dreamed up at Amy West 2021. There have only been two SCSI boards ever built for the Zorro 3 bus of the Amiga 3000 and 4000, which uh, the Zorro 3 bus is significantly faster than the Zorro 2 bus that was used on the Amiga 2000. One was the Fastlane Z3 from Phase 5, and that board is highly proprietary. None of the logic is available anymore. So if any of those boards dies, it's just that you have to throw it in the trash. These are programmable logic chips. And along with the design files of uh, other things that Dave Haney released, he also released the source code to all of the programmable logic on this particular board. And if you go back and, and look at uh, chips that were, were done back in the early 90s, the programmable logic chips, usually they're, they're read protected. But because Dave Haney released the source code to these programmable logic chips, we were able to take and, and reproduce this board today. We wanted to keep this board alive at all costs. So we didn't want to destroy the board in the process of analyzing it. And so we went through a lot of effort to keep the board alive and functioning because we knew that there are several steps to the process in the end. And creating the PCB itself is only one of the many steps. So if we destroy the board in the first step, all the other steps that would come after might not be possible anymore. So you don't want to cut off the, the branch of the tree that you're sitting on, obviously, right? One of the things that we really wanted to get to is, is to create a driver framework that uh, others can expand on. There are a lot of APIs that uh, Commodore at some point or its successors have defined on how to write drivers for Amiga OS. And so we are complying with a lot more of those APIs, making this driver potentially also a good basis for others that uh, want to build storage controllers of sorts for the Amiga. And then also fill in some of the gaps that uh, the original driver had because of his age. So the original driver, for example, did not very well support hard drives that are bigger than four gigabytes. The original driver could not boot off a CD-ROM. We added a debugging menu, an early startup menu, where you can probe the disks that are on the board. You can uh, get the hardware settings um, that have been configured on the board. We also reproduced the box um, that the card originally came in. We reproduced the manual and the disc. Also, we had uh, metal brackets made by a friend of ours in the United Kingdom. Neither Chris nor I had ever done this before, and we were literally challenging each other. It's like, can we even do this? And to be honest, I, I didn't believe that we could. Um, and so going through this, like, it's a, it's a very good exercise. It's a lot of fun, and 
I can only encourage people to, if you guys watch this, like, find a project like this yourself and then just try it. Of course, a fast SCSI controller demands reliable storage. That's where rabbit hole computing comes in. We've been selling SCSI SD boards for about five years now, um, both V5 and V6. And uh, uh, earlier this year, we announced and released uh, our successor to SCSI to SDV5, Zulu SCSI, which is significantly faster, the same price, and has support for synchronous SCSI and all kinds of things that V5 didn't. The ongoing global components shortage uh, affects our ability to assemble both SCSI to SDV5 and V6. Um, both the FPGA used in SCSI to SDV6, as well as the actual microcontroller, which is an SDM32 based MCU, uh, are uh, unobtainable in, from any distributor or directly from ST themselves. And that's actually what uh, led to us deciding to develop Zulu SCSI. Zulu SCSI is uh, used and configured in a completely different way. Um, SCSI to SD is married to a configuration utility that is GUI based, it runs on Windows, Mac, or Linux. Many people found it cumbersome. The Zulu SCSI uses file names. A lot of people find this easy because you don't need any software. You can edit a text file anywhere. You can edit a file name with any computer. When we initially launched Zulu SCSI, we wanted to make sure we wouldn't end up in a similar situation in the future where the microcontroller we were using suddenly becomes unavailable to us. As a plan B, we developed this board based on a Raspberry Pi Foundation's microcontroller, which is called the RP2040. We didn't know how it was going to perform. We didn't know even if we were going to bring it to market. Zulu SCSI RP2040 can saturate a 10 megabyte per second SCSI bus on reads. Um, which is incredible. It gives V6 a run for its money unless you care about write speed, in which case it's simply not comparable there. But it is an incredibly affordable and widely available microcontroller. We typically have a sales table. That fluctuates from year to year based on what the club has taken in in donations. Um, a lot of our revenue comes from people just donating their, their stuff that they don't want to the club so we can sell it and help, help pay for the event. If we have a games competition, uh, that's uh, something that I do personally with my sons. Custom trophy, uh, resin printed. Uh, my brother modeled it and uh, I printed and painted. We have the banquet. Uh, we have a, a catered, catered meal come in. We typically have a, a, a featured speaker at the banquet. Thanks, Bill. And then afterwards people just stay. And um, as I was told by the whole hotel this year, we stayed way too long. <laughs> I believe we have people here until 5 o'clock in the morning and the staff were trying to kick them out so they could actually work on the room. <laughs> we have a raffle that we do. Um, we have a lot of sponsors around the world who donate different um, parts or, or gift cards or, or magazine subscriptions, just a variety of different things that we can raffle off to help um, pay for the show. And then, of course, we have speakers. One of the things that's getting lost more and more in the companies that I've done over the years, especially the bigger the company, the farther away you get from that sense of camaraderie, that, that, that intimacy. And, and it was an intimacy where, you know, we knew the names of one another's pets and, and, and you, you didn't have to ask about dietary considerations when you're inviting someone over for dinner. You knew already. And it was, you know, that kind of closeness with each other. And part of that, I believe, came out of the fact that, you know, we had that, many of us had that driving force behind us that we weren't doing it for the money. We're doing it for something bigger, some more noble undertaking on our parts and I, I think uh, 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 that's a quality that's been lost in later efforts I was part of that that kind of humility that kind of acceptance and no one was trying to get ahead no one was ever trying to advance your career and worried about promotions or any of that stuff. It was just a bunch of wacky people who were on a mission together. The Amiga has a soul. The Amiga has, you, you know, when, when you use one, when you get, when you got one back in the 80s or early 90s, you felt attached to your Amiga. And it was hard to let that feeling go. Like, for example, even when I got my nice 486 and maybe 
1995, my mind would always go back to, well, you know, my Amiga could have done this better. Oh, my Amiga could have. And I noticed that that feeling never really went away. I was a VIC-20 Commodore 64 kid back in my youth. Uh, when it came time for me to make the Amiga decision, my, I was going to, to university and my parents convinced me I needed to get a quote-unquote real computer, not another game machine, and I ended up with a PC. And at the time I thought that was great and, and life went on. Uh, fast forward to around 2017, I was sitting around thinking, you know, I've got my old Commodore still, I still play with Adam. What did I miss with the Amiga? Let me. Let me go on eBay and pick up a machine. I had been in touch with a seller and he reached back out to me and said, Hey, Jerry, he says, if you still want an Amiga, why don't you come to the club? And I paused and thought, there's a club for Amiga that still meets? You have my complete attention. Complete attention. I will be at the next meeting. I learned about Ami West. I learned that it was still happening. and. And I just came on my own one year. I was curious what they were doing. Um, and I've met some wonderful lifelong friends here. I met Bill Borsari here. I've, I've worked with him at two different companies. And um, he, was, uh, he was in my wedding party. He's a fantastic guy. And um, so I have some lifelong friendships as a result of having randomly showed up to the show 15 years ago. I built friendships with these guys over the past five years and you know I feel like part of the family now. My first Amy West but it's so cool because part of the toaster team got back together. Mark Randall was here, Kiki Stockhammer, Robert Blackwell. Robert and Mark I have not seen in decades so just an awesome event and so glad I got to come to it. It's the people. First and foremost, the, the people here, they, they share a common love of the platform, and that love is from different aspects of video, audio, programming, next-gen classic. It's, they've got a common tie of, of Amiga love, but these guys have known each other for a very, very long time, and it's almost like a family reunion to see these guys come together. They go into their groups. They catch up on the things that they haven't been able to share over the past year and it's just like a big family reunion for the weekend. That's what the club's really about, is keeping that, uh, the classic stuff going, working with the people to show them the new stuff, and show them that there's, you know, the Amiga is still very much alive. Well, that's it for our look back at Annie West 2022. Reporting for the internet, I'm Kevin Bryce.